everyone. For this mini lecture, we're going to be exploring or reviewing ways that we organize data and how to leverage those organizations of our data to help us as we're working with our data. Again, I'm Kristen Hunter Thompson. Feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. So as we get started, let's just do a personal reflection. So you can just think about these prompts or you can write down your responses to them, but it's always good to sort of pause for a moment before we dive in. So when it comes to organizing data, what are some yellow lights for you with organizing data? What are things that slow you down? What questions do you have about how or why we organize data? And then what are some red lights with organizing data? What, what stops you in your tracks when you go to try to do it, when you try to organize your data? Where, where do you just get stuck? So I encourage you to pause the video, reflect on these questions. As I said, you can just do it in your head or you can jot down some notes, but just take a moment to think for you personally, what are some feelings or experiences that you've had with organizing data? Okay, I wanna start off with that with this quote from Nathan Yao, who works, who runs flowingdata.com. When he says, I spend just as much time getting data in the format that I need as I do putting the visual part of the graphic together. And I just wanna share this because this is oftentimes something that this is a key part of working with data is getting the data into the format that we can actually do something with it. And this is, but this is a part that we, are rarely ever exposed to in the K to 12 space where we're learning how to work with data. And this is entirely understandable because it takes time to think about how to format and how to organize our data. And oftentimes when we're working with data in, K to, in the K to 12 space, we're working with the data towards a content objective. And so it's what can we make meaning from of the data is where we're going to and where we're trying to get our students to. But the challenge is, is that that leaves us with a false sense that if it's taking time for us to organize our data or format our data, that something must be wrong. Because we're so often given data in this like beautifully organized, pre-processed way. Um, when in fact, in reality, whenever we work with data ourselves, it's rarely ever organized or formatted in a direction that we need. And I just, so I just want to put that out there that this is something that every single person works with when they are or when they're working with data themselves either that they have collected or that somebody else has collected and they are using to to make sense of to create a visualization of so in essence every time we're actually going to use data going forward or anytime our students might use data going forward they're going to need to think about how to organize and format the data so that's just a, like everybody's in this boat one other thing that I want to bring up is that we want to look for data that's called normalized. And what that means is that we have as fine a detail as we can possible in the data. So here along the left hand side, we're looking at data where we've got for each movie in Star Wars, we've got the actual critic review of that movie and then who reviewed it, as opposed to these data on the right are called cross tabulated. You don't need to know the difference of these kinds of, of these words of how we talk about them. But, but in essence, these are summarized, right? Here I'm giving, I, this information tells me that there are six Star Wars movies and that the max rating was an 8.7, but I have no idea which of these six movies it came from or what the critical rating was. Were they all the rest of them 8.6 or were some of them 2.3 or 5.8 you have no idea and so that's why it can be really helpful when we are when we are looking for data and or when we're collecting our own data to collect data as it is as fine a detail as we can we can always summarize out that those details later but if we don't have the details we it limits what kinds of questions we can ask so let's review data tables and sort of how, when we're using a wide organization of our data in data tables, how it works well and how we can do it. So data tables in this format, remember, um, they're really good for data collection. It makes it much easier for us to think about collection and for us to share post-interpretation what we have found in our data out to other people. 
And so remembering, um, sort of remembering how we set our data tables, our data tables are used as little space as possible on an eight and a half and 11 piece of paper, sort of to cram as much information as we can in, into the rows and the columns. The challenge is, is that it's not good for exploratory data analysis, for asking a wide range of questions and getting a sense of what's going on in our data. And part of that is, so this data table is set up to be a cross tabulated, where we are totaling the number of individuals that are liberal, moderate, or conservative, and then we are calculating and providing the percentage of the total class that are liberal, moderate, and conservative. So we don't have information on each individual member of the class as to whether or not they are liberal, moderate, or conservative. We just have a summary, a summary value of it. So that can work for cross-tabulated data. It can also work for, um, we can also have some troubles if, even if it's normalized data. So this is the actual value of life expectancy in 1952 for Afghanistan. But the other trick is that when we use this wide organization, again, it's efficient for collecting the information and it's efficient for sharing this information after the fact. But the challenge is, is that when it comes to exploring our data, so running different st statistical analyses on it, or but even more just visualizing the data so that we can see what's going on in anything besides this wide organization of a table, it means that it gets really tricky because life expectancy is a value that's in a cell. It's not in its own column. And it also means that we don't know the units. Like here it's pretty common sense that the units for life expectancy are years, but there are some data that we work with often where it's not at all intuitive what the units are for the variable that we've collapsed into the cell. And so what this means is that when we go to try to, let's say we're interested in looking at how life expectancy has changed within different countries across time. So let's say we're, we're trying to look at Afghanistan. In order to graph that, you know, we could you know, collect, all, whoop, collect all of these data from Afghanistan across the four years. And then if we put that into Excel or Google Sheets or any of those spreadsheet programs that we use for our graphing, it's going to give us four different points as opposed to a line connecting those four different points. And that's because it reads each of those columns as different information. So it makes it sort of tricky and cumbersome as we're fighting the, the graphing program to get it to graph the data the way that we want to. And a lot of it has to do with the data just aren't organized in a way that makes it easiest for us to look at. So, but I do wanna say that data tables are useful and we use data tables a lot. So we use them for collecting our data at the beginning of an investigation and we use them for sharing the, the summarized data or even some raw data if we don't have too much in a tabular form with others after we have explored and made sense of our data. And so when we're doing that, there's some things that we want to keep in mind on how we set up our data tables. So we want to make sure that all the variables are named with their units so that somebody can easily make sense of what it is that we're actually, what, what it is they're looking at in the table. We want to label the purpose of the column. So the columns might not necessarily be the variables. So if they're the treatment groups, if they are a summary statistic, we wanna make sure that we, we have those clearly labeled as well as what the purpose of the rows are. Like how have we delineated what the rows are and what information we're including across those rows. If there are any summary statistics that you're including, in your table, so mean, median, mode, standard deviation, standard error, any of those kinds of statistics that you have calculated from the raw data, you want to identify what it is, right? So that, that, so that folks know, oh, this is the mode versus the median. And we often put those either far to the far right-hand side in the columns or on the, or on the bottom of a table, though that depends on what data you have and what you're trying to make easiest for the, re the reader to read. Remembering that in the Western Hemisphere, we read left to right and top to bottom. So where we place things in our table will also influence how people, how and when people see them. 
And then finally, you want to include a descriptive caption or legend for your, for your table that enables the reader to, as they're scanning the data, to interpret it effectively. So it's not helpful to tell your reader data from countries, years, like life expectancy data from countries and years, because we can read that if you've labeled your columns and rows and variables. But what is helpful are data collected on life expectancy across different years from different nations by the World Health Organization using the XYZ survey that was administered in the spring. That is context that is helpful for people to understand about the data that are in. Really, it gives them the context to understand the sample of the data that you have. Okay, so those are data tables. Let's think about sort of spreadsheets and how we input our data into these spreadsheet programs to graph it or into other programs to actually graph our data so that we can explore the data visually and statistically. So here is an image of a Google Sheet, but really this is just to, this is to indicate any of these programs where we're inputting the data so that we can explore and tinker and visualize and iterate and ask questions of our data as we're exploring it to try to figure out what it is we can interpret from the data and then communicate out is our interpretation. So how do we leverage these? Well, we use this long, sorry, this long organization, not wide, long, where each variable has its own column. So these are the same data that we saw a few slides back and where instead of Afghanistan being one year and years being the different columns with life expectancy in the cells, life expectancy with its units now is its own column. So it's far easier for us to select Afghanistan or the years and life expectancy added into a, you know, have the program create a graph for us and then it will, and then it will easily develop the graph of, I wanna look at life expectancy in Afghanistan across years and it will point, it will plot those points. Um, this is how we can set up our data in a way that we can more easily graph it in different ways. We can graph by country, we can graph by year, we can graph by life expectancy. All three of our variables are set up in a way that we can now pull from it more easily to create graphs for us to explore the data to figure out what stories might exist within the data. So when it comes to organizing our data in this format, in this long, tidy format, as it is referred to, there are a few things that we wanna make sure we do. So each row has to be every observation. So any time data were collected across any of our variables needs to be its own, needs to be its own row. So it can't be embedded within a cell of a different row. So Afghanistan is a country but we collected information from Afghanistan in different years. And so then Afghanistan is one layer, year is another layer, each year gets its own, own row, and then we can fill in the life expectancy. And then every cell has to have the corresponding value. So you'll see back here, I didn't merge these four rows of Afghanistan, even though they're exactly the same. Instead, they all list Afghanistan to let me know. And that's because if these were all merged, then it would be really challenging for me to go through. Let's say I'm just interested in comparing the 1962 life expectancy across different countries. If this was merged as Afghanistan, the way the, the, progr the spreadsheet programs are, pro are uh, backend coded is that actually, although it visually looks like it sits across these four rows, it's only actually tagged to this first row. So if I was trying to pull 1962, I would lose the information that it was from Afghanistan. It just sort of makes it a little bit more cumbersome to make the graph and that you're interested in looking at. And then similarly, we've talked about every variable has its own column. So don't stick any data about a variable within, some, within another row or column. It needs to have its own thing. And this is so it makes it easier to graph the data. So, so this is just another way of looking at it from Hadley Wickham and Garrett Rolmund. So the variables should be in the columns. Each of our observations should be in a row. And then each of these cells should have its own value within it. 
And that uh, organizes our data in a way that graphing programs, be it our spreadsheet programs that we're asking to make graphs for us or graph-based programs, this is how they're expecting the data to come in so that we can more easily determine what are the variables, what are the different attributes of this data set that you want to be able to compare, you know, that we want to be able to compare so the graphing program can create the graphs for us. And so just again, rather than going from something like this where we've embedded a lot within a cell or we've merged cells, each one should be its own row. So again, here's a great example of these cells got merged and we lost this information across the different periods of these different, um, of these different data collection, these observations. Just another thing when we're also doing this, everything should have it. This is an example of everything should have its own column. So rather than 6.5, the quantitative value and slight acidic, the qualitative descriptor of that, those should be in their own columns. This is a numeric, a numeric or quantitative variable, and this is a qualitative or categorical variable. Now we can graph them differently. And so by setting up these sort of, by organizing and formatting our data in this kind of way, it takes time at the beginning, but then it makes it so much easier for us to graph and explore the data to make sense of what the data are showing us and how it relates back to the broader phenomenon. So some takeaways from organizing data, how you organize it, whether it's the wide organization of a data table or the long or tidy organization that we often put into our spreadsheet programs or our graphing programs, it depends on what you want to do with the data and what you want to find out from the data. If you're just looking to look up something quick from a data table, then by all means use the data table, the wide organization of the data table. It's easy for our eyes to scan across and make sense of what's in the data table. If we have things labeled and we've provided that context-based description. Um, but if you're looking to run statistical analyses or to visualize your data or to kind of explore and tinker and ask questions of it, then the long organization is a better way to go initially. There's no one right way to organize a data set, but you really have to think consciously of what it is that you want to do or ask of your data. Typically our data tables help us collect data while we're in the field or in the lab or wherever it is we're collecting data or to emphasize these found relationships or to summarize the data that we have after we've done our analysis interpretation of the data. So that's why we see them a lot in our uh, peer reviewed published articles. That's why we include them in our lab reports, the data table, because it's a quick way to be able to look up information. Typically our spreadsheets or how we organize data to actually visualize it enables us to find those relationships, to compare the groups, to explore the variability, to ask questions of the data and see what stories our data have as it relates to our testable question. So just some things to keep in mind. I hope this has been helpful. If you have any other further questions about how or why we organize data, or when to organize data in a wide in a data table organization format versus in a long, tidy organization format, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Have a good day.